Well, thank you uh, for that uh, introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to you. Can you hear me this, uh, this morning? Uh, it's a great honor to be here. And um, I was thinking about what I would talk about, and it occurred to me that next year, in two th next summer, is the 20th anniversary of the Autonomous Underwater Student Competition that we started 19 years ago, 20 years ago. So I thought it would be a good subject to talk about. And um, the, what motivated me at the time, and this was in the mid-90s when we started to develop a lot of the AUB technology was, well, ultimately, like everything else, it's all gonna be about people. And you know, people were wringing their hands about STEM, um, not many people majoring in engineering and various kinds of um, scarcities of, of the, you know, the pipeline. And so I got tired of hearing all those, all the hand wringing and decided, that, well, let's do something about it. So we started this competition and uh, now it's going into its 20th year. It's been quite successful. I'll, I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about that, but, um, and it also spawned, as, as Jill reminded me yesterday, it spawned the mate competition and Robo Boat and Robot X and Saucy in Europe and Eurathlon, a number of other competitions um, grew out of that original one. So it, um, it's been quite successful in exposing a lot of engineering students to systems engineering in the underwater environment. And so, um, as you can see, the title of my talk is Autonomy Through Competition. It was all focused, it's focused on auton autonomous underwater vehicles. And um, so autonomy is one of those key um, words that's important, and so is competition and getting them together. So I don't want to spend a lot of time, I'm going to blast through a bunch of stuff on autonomy because it's, a, as I indicate up here, it's, it's a buzzword now. It's a big buzzword, and everybody just wants autonomy, and I'll show you uh, examples of that. Uh, nobody knows what it means, really. There's no, it's hard to quantify. There are no units, um, but um, it's, it is a buzzword. But back in the mid-'90s when I started the competition, nobody was talking about autonomy. It wasn't a buzzword. Nobody, there were not many robotic competitions then, and so a lot has changed in 20 years. And so the, I want to finish up with where are we going from here with the competition, and it's, it's exciting. Um, as I indicate there, the, um, the but, and I don't, I'm, I'm going to go through a bunch of slides here very quickly. I don't expect you to read them, but if you can get my talk later if you want to. But I just want to give you a feeling for the buzz. Okay, it's, there are all kinds of studies and reports and everything on autonomy. And they're all different, they all disagree and agree on certain things. No, and, and again, it's just, I just want to give you a feeling for that before getting into the, the competition because it is a competition focused on autonomous vehicles. And I'll show you a, um, a couple of three minute videos toward the end of the one this summer. Um, and as you can see, there are definitions, views, levels, frameworks, standards, architectures, competencies, you know, of all kinds of things uh, involving autonomy. And as, as we can see from this little cartoon, um, it, it's also, autonomy is also uh, subject to the environment. And so it can be even too hot for autonomy, okay? So, um, of course there are dif diction dictionary definitions of autonomy and these are various definitions from, you know, English dictionaries and American dictionaries and various, um, advisory committees and workshops and science boards, etc. So those are definitions of, you know, from a strict definition point of view. There's also different views of autonomy. There's user views, you know, a person using a robot, using an autonomous vehicle. There's the roboticist's view. There's the machine learning view. There's the cognitive view. You look at these things differently depending on the on the on the field you are coming from and um, your particular technical expertise. Then there's there's these levels of autonomy, eye charts. Okay, uh, based on the classic observe, orient, decide, act paradigm, and you know you can, you can go through all the stuff and try to categorize your platform on terms of levels of autonomy. Of course, then. 
various workshops have sort of poo-pooed that idea and said, well, we shouldn't use these levels of autonomy. We should use some more cognitive-based system and, and, you know, uh, and talk about uh, resilient capability rather than functional capabilities, et cetera. So, and you can get all these reports if, and read them if you want. Um, and then there's architectures. There's various architectures. A lot of the students now are using ROS, the open, open architecture system for robotics. Um, there have been various, Caracas has actually came out of the space program. Um, there are lots of different, well, hand, let's say a do, half a dozen major architectures that are used. Um, I noticed, I noted my own little um, comment here because that sensors and platforms are never independent. That's one of my roles, although, you know, because people try to modularize these things and pretend like you can just have a system that you can move, move to a piece, software system, control system, um, autonomy system that you can move from platform to platform. That may be true at a certain high level, but uh, my experience has been that Sensors and platforms are never independent. You, know, you can only push modularity down to a certain level. And um, uh, at, at that level, um, things are not swappable without a lot of careful calibration and work. So um, then there are standards. Of course, ASTM as a subcommittee trying to standardize these things. I mean, this, this stuff becomes important for acquisition programs like in the Navy, for example, where you have to put out an RFP and specify level, what, what, do you, what, what level of autonomy or what kind of autonomy you are asking people to propose to. And uh, so, and these are ongoing subcommittees still struggling with some of this stuff. One of the ones I like the best, are, and NIST has been in this business for many years, uh, mostly on land robots, but the, 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 arc, the, the coordinate system is applicable to anything. And I like this particular one where you have a three axis view of the world in terms of environmental difficulty, mission complexity, and human independence. Um, and that's been, there have been many workshops in comp on, on that alpha view, the autonomous levels for undersea, under un unmanned systems. Um, this, this is one that I, this is my, the, the one I like, kind of my view of things, and it, this is how we're going, we, we kind of structure the competitions in a way. And I look at it in terms of core competencies, okay? Um, that's what I call it. And essentially for a mobile autonomous platform or system, um, you need to have at least seven core competencies, in my opinion, if you want to consider yourself fully autonomous. Um, you have to be able to navigate through the world, okay? And, and you have to adapt to an, an environment that's going to be changing all the time. I mean, basically you have to survive. I mean, that's job one for, for, for any kind of autonomous system. And then there's a couple of competencies in terms of identifying objects. One is stationary and the other is moving. You have to be able to do that sort of thing. And then a couple of competencies involving object manipulation, either external objects interacting with them, moving around, or an object that you have, like a payload of some sort. And then there's a very complicated, you know, up kind of upper level cognitive ability to optimize all these things and do the right thing, make good decisions. So I, those are my, you know, kind of views of what an autonomous systems core, what, how to define the competencies, you know, uh, and determine if a system is autonomous. Um, now, of course, you know, the first objective of most parents is to make autonomous people, not autonomous robots. So. <laughs> Uh, and it, that's actually what drives my view of those, rather than these, you know, frameworks and levels and all the stuff I just blasted through. It, you would like your son or daughter to have those seven core competencies, I believe, before you turn them loose in the world, okay? <laughs> Despite what, how they're categorized with levels and all this other stuff, architectures. You would like them to be able to navigate and get along and adapt to the environment and all the things I just said. So. That's, uh, I don't think it's any different whether you're talking about an autonomous person or autonomous robot, autonomous vehicle. So um, probably the most, the epitome of an autonomous vehicle, uh, undersea vehicle, was a Cold War nuclear submarine. Um, and the only reason, the reason I mention this is because there is a, there is a, a difference between autonomous 
and unmanned. Those are often confused. This system was manned, but highly autonomous. And sometimes those words are interchanged without much thought. Unmanned, autonomous. I used to, when I first started these, a lot of the programs we were talking about at O&R, I used to cross out the U and put A all the time just to distinguish my program, because there were UUV programs, still are UUV programs, unmanned underwater vehicles. I was trying to create autonomous underwater vehicles. So, but I just, this just, just keeps you, and by the way, back in the 50s, you could buy one yourself for 698, so, so, you know, it was, it was cool. Uh, so, okay, um, back, uh, back in, 2005, a, a bunch of us, you know, after talking about this forever, you know, we published this little, you know, formula for autonomy and intelligence, you know, just as sort of a lighthearted thing in an MTS article uh, where we just basically tried to somehow put together a formulation for autonomy and intelligence, two things that don't have you and it's hard to quantify. And, and, you know, the idea was basically that autonomy is somehow connected to communication, you know, to, to interaction. If, if you don't hear ever from something, it's maybe totally autonomous, but, you know, you don't know, you, you, can, you can't tell. And if you're just communicating with it every second, it's, it's not really that autonomous. So, and the same thing with intelligence in terms of completing the missions. And if you plot those up, you know, you realize, you know, you always want to be up here in the top left right quadrant, you know, because there are people that are, and, and robots that operate in all these quadrants, and, but, you know, <laughs> the, this was also from the paper, by the way, you can read that in the MTS journal paper. Um, so, here's, here's, here's where I'm coming from, from for the competitions. Over here on the left, those are the covers of all those reports, and it, that's just a sampling, there's more, there's lots more of those, you can go read them, that, of that have, that have been reports on autonomy in the last, uh, you know, half a dozen years, 10 years, and there's still studies and you know, some, there was just one that just came out, a summer study. Um, so that's all the guy, you know, the experts, the cognoscenti, you know, the autonomy gurus getting together, blue ribbon panels. Then there's the wisdom of the crowd. This is the student competitions, in my opinion. Okay, these are the guys and gals that are going to teach us what autonomy really is. And if you, there's some pretty good evidence if you read Tariki's book on Wisdom of the Crowds that they get it right more often than these people do. <laughs> okay, and now that we've got, there were 49 teams this summer, 500 young, you know, round number, 500, 600 young engineers, unbiased in general, um, very diverse group international, competing to do the same tasks, it's starting to actually um, fulfill the, the requirements of the wisdom of the crowd. I mean, you know, it's, you have, it's, it's not any crowd is not wise, but this crowd has all the characteristics of being wise. So the, our challenge is to construct the future competitions to bring out the wisdom from these hundreds and hundreds of young minds um, that um, are wrestling with the tasks at hand. And that's, that's a lot of fun. And um, as I said at the beginning, my, my motivation back in the, in the um, so I'm gonna segue that into the competitions here. Um, this is just a, a snapshot of actually the t-shirts from the first uh, one in 97 up to well, I didn't. I just went up to 14 here, but the, you know, basically there was a whole bunch of T-shirts, and also sponsorship has grown. Um, and I just threw in, just in passing, mostly for uh, Jerry Boatman. <laughs> uh, at the same time we started the competitions, we started the AV Fest, and also a Modem Fest and Single X Fest, and, and um, those are still going too. At least the AV Fest is, and that was to interface prototype. Uh, vehicles with, with industry at sea. That's the, that's the gyre up there. I mean, not just like this in PowerPoints or exhibits. Going to sea together, seeing how they work, having a, a lot of interaction with the developers. And that's been very successful and um, it's a good way to transition technology. So, um, 
This is, the, this is for the AEV competition. I mean, we've had, uh, it's been growing and growing. In fact, managing growth is an issue at this point. Um, and, you know, there's been well over 5,000 students that have um, participated over the years and where they all are now and how this affected. I know where some of them are. They're working in industry and labs, but it'd be fun to track some of the, track the rest of them. Uh, I put this together, this little taxonomy, because, you know, as I said at the beginning, in 95, nobody talked about autonomy, and there weren't many robotic competitions. Now there are tons of robotic competitions. And um, in fact, it gets, it, gets, it gets confusing. So that's why I just threw this together, because people they use the word competition like they use the word autonomy very loosely. Well, we have a competition. Well, there's the DARPA Grand Challenge, you know, the Grand Challenge, the XPRIZE, all those things. There's games, all kinds of games. There's combat, you know, robo combat things. Um, I just wanted to be clear, and I keep having to drag people back to this, that the, the AAB competition is, a, is an educational competition. It's learning exercise. It's not, you know, to make a lot of money or, you know, beat the other guy up or kill the other guy or something. It's, it's basically, and then you can have autonomous and human control. Of course, human control is the mate competition is a good example, and that's been tremendously successful. Jill has done a fabulous job with mate. I mean, I've really been impressed with that. And, um, and then there's various kinds of, you know, the, the Formula One versus the freeform thing. Um, and we're somewhere in the middle here. We, we constrain platform size, but not to the point where you can't have fun doing creative things. So, I, you know, I just tried to make that clear because there, there's a lot of other, you know, competitions that you can enter these days. Um, just here's a, an interesting trend I just noted this year. This was the first, the winners and you know the participants in the first back in the 90s, and this is uh, this a couple months ago in the summer. And I just want to point out that one of the interesting trends is, um, you know, something like five out of the top seven place places were not were teams from inter, more international teams were not from the U.S. This has been growing in recent years. There are teams from India, from Thailand, from Russia, from China, from Canada, and of course a few U.S. teams. But um, the rest of the world is is really coming on strong. This was not true a few years ago, um, and the international component of this has really, really been developing. Um, let's see if I can get this video to play here and uh, give you a little flavor of this year's competition. The main thing that distinguishes RoboSub is that the submarines in this competition must be fully autonomous. The bots here are much more than ROVs. Each must navigate the course and complete the tasks without any student intervention. Attaining true autonomy is the most challenging part of this competition. For mobile platforms, the three building blocks of autonomy are navigation, perception, and intervention. Those are broad classes of behaviors that everything else depends on. A big part of autonomy is determining when a task has actually been completed. For now, most teams' robo-subs assume a task is completed based on visual cues and timing. Hopefully, this will become more sophisticated in the future. So the robot knows if a task has completed or failed, mostly um, visual cues, so with the cameras. So let's say if we hit a buoy, if we see it moving still, or if we line it up orientation-wise, for that buoy to be in the middle and we go a certain distance. So the biggest thing would just be testing to make sure that's right. Our strategy for our autonomous code is basically we need to get to the waypoints that we set out in advance. Once we're close to where we think the competition element should be, we use the vision navigation control to identify key elements in the pool. Based on the different lighting conditions and geometric distortion, we correct for that in code. Then we set a new waypoint to drive to, uh, controlling its orientation and position along the way. Some teams incorporate a decision-making algorithm that prioritizes tasks automatically to maximize point scoring. The robot stores a list of tasks and decides which one to do based on how long it would take to get to that task and how long the task itself takes, as well as how much points the task is worth. 
in the beginning, in our very first year, we were just running based on doing everything sequentially. And then we moved on to incorporate the timers, the more decision-making part of things. And then now, what we're actually doing is that since Dave put in the random finger, now we actually need to know which obstacle we are at and then make decisions based on that too. So I think that every year we incorporate a certain part that adds on to the autonomous system. One thing that makes underwater autonomy difficult is that you can't use GPS for navigation because radio waves don't travel well through water. A Doppler Velocity Log, or DVL, is a similar sensor that operates under the water acoustically, but it's much more expensive than a GPS receiver. Some teams have been able to afford one, while others have looked for alternatives. Last year, we relied heavily on the Doppler Velocity Log in order to map where the points were. This year, it uses the DVL to still get it close to the obstacle, but once it gets to the obstacle, it completely switches over to the camera system, and then it will continue with its normal mission for that obstacle. We try and do the path less traveled and try to do all those tasks without a DVL, which is more challenging, but we are trying to come up with strategies using sonar, cameras, and IMU to get this done. The goal of the competition is to prepare engineers for the difficult challenges of real-world autonomy. Right now we have gliders that go out and measure the ocean current and temperature and give us the data that we need to feed our weather models. And they're out there for six months to a year and they're only supervised once every day. So we're talking long periods of time where things change drastically from what they thought was going to be the conditions to what it is now. We look forward to seeing new developments in autonomy next year at RoboSub's 20th anniversary. Stay tuned at RoboNation.org. All right, so that gives you a little flavor for the competition, and I'm going to skip this other video. I'm um, just got a couple more slides here. Let me get off. Um, here's my a, a few persistent observations over 20 years. Uh, of me, I've been a judge at almost all of them, and some of the other uh, mates and robo-boat, et cetera. These are, these are my, my common threads that I see persistently. Um, first is that sensing intervention tasks tend to be engineered at the expense of basic vehicle navigation and control. Engineer students, engineering students with engineering minds, you know, like the complicated thing. They, they'll engineer the heck out of something and the vehicle, you know, can't steer a straight line, you know. <laughs> so they forget that to get to that task, you have to, you have to get, you know, things that don't leak and can, can navigate. So, but that's a very persistent. I mean, I see that in all any other competitions too. Um, this is an important one. The second one is there's not a good appreciation. I'm thinking of writing something about this between complexity and reliability. You know, there's a lot of, these competitions typically have 10 tasks or something. You don't have to do them all. You can do any of them in any order. But they, you know, we're gonna do them all. Well, that's a complicated vehicle to do that. And unless you have a, an awful lot of time to test it, you probably, it's probably not gonna be reliable. It's probably not gonna work. And they don't, students don't have a lot of time typically. So this is, you'd be better off doing a few tasks well. But that's not fully appreciated a lot of times. Um, it's, you know, this is a classic. I mean, it's a lot harder to make things work underwater. I mean, you can't, there's no substitute for testing. And, and I think this is something we want to move towards um, because there is a tendency, given time constraints, to put a lot of effort into reinventing mechanical things when we really want them to do autonomy things. So, you know, this developer kit idea, I think, is a good idea, and we want to pursue that. Um, Future directions, I mean, this is a work in progress, and IEEE now is in involved with, uh, with, the, with, with the international part of it and actually all of it, and I've been working with Bill Kirkwood on some, where we go from here. Um, I think the idea is we want to try to normalize, there's a lot of competitions now, we want to try to normalize them on the basis of these class, classes of tasks so we can sort of compare apples with apples in terms of performance. And then, um, you know, like I said, growth management is an issue. So we have to do kind of like what Mate's done, you know, have regional qualifying things. And that's why it's important to normalize them. And, um, and, and then again, learn from the students. I mean, create tasks that can be solved in a number of different ways and then see what they do. This is the wisdom of the crowd idea. Um, and this is my final slide. I just, I just thought I'd give you some things to think about, which are probably pretty controversial. <laughs> this is about AAVs in general. That's the end of the competitions, okay? 
Um, I think the degree to which a, an autonomous underwater vehicle will actually become useful, that is a product that let's say the Navy uses operationally, is related to its perceived expendability. You know, think about that. Um, you know, it's, the old, it's just a reformulation of the old adage, don't put anything over the side you don't want to lose. You know, that's, that's people, you know, if you go to sea, that you, you learn that. But, um, uh, and I think acquired data from an autonomous underwater vehicle should be more valuable than the platform itself. Another thing to think about. Um, this one is not for me, the middle one there, but it's, it was, in a, it was a, um, uh, from a paper by this, by Goodrich. You know, autonomy level increases, the breadth of tasks can be handled decreases. Interesting thing to think about. And then, of course, trust is huge. Some of these reports are focused on that. If, and no matter how good it is, if the operator doesn't trust it, it won't be used. That's it. And, um, and also, the, the final one, because like I say, when you, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of missions that really, you know, autonomous platforms are not the answer, the best answer for, but, you know, um, but these days, because of the buzz, you know, everything's, the answer is always unmanned, autonomous or something. So you have to be, you know, you really want to focus on what those systems, these systems are best at, do, do best at and, and develop them for those reasons and not try to stretch them to, to the point where, um, you know, it'd be just, it'd be cheaper and easier and better to use a human-based system. So, and then of course, the combination is the key have a human uh, robot system that works together, and that's a very active area of research. So I'll leave you with those thoughts. Thank you for your attention, and I'm enjoy enjoying the rest of the meeting.